right. Gentlemen, we are going to start a new book uh, tonight, the book of Acts. We're going to be starting, obviously, in chapter 1, verse 1. But before we uh, jump into uh, the Bible study tonight, we are going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you as men. Lord, just thank you for uh, making us men. And Lord, help us, Lord, to walk as men should. Lord, we know that your word gives us instructions and responsibilities as men and as husbands. So Lord, help us fulfill that role, Lord, in its entirety, in its completeness, in its wholeness. Lord, continue to work in us and through us, Lord, to be the best husbands or the best men that we can be uh, to not just our wives, but everyone that we may come in contact with. So, Lord, uh, may your word um, be honored and glorified and exemplified uh, tonight, and may your words be my words as I share uh, through the book of Acts chapter 1 tonight. So, Lord, we just thank you again for this opportunity. Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every man here uh, tonight. Lord, uh, encourage us as we go through this word and as we leave here tonight. Protect us with safety as we travel home. And Lord, I pray that there will be a, a nugget of wisdom uh, that uh, we're able to share tonight. Lord, that each and every one of us will be able to um, pray about, think about, and uh, meditate on during the, the days and weeks to come. So Lord, we also pray for the ladies in the other room. Uh, Lord, some of them are wives. Lord, that they would be uh, blessed uh, as well with their Bible study. Lord, just encourage them as well. And may we be in a great encouragement uh, to our wives if they're present over there as well. And may we share our Bible studies with one another on the way home tonight. Uh, and Lord, just discuss your word. That, that would be honoring and glorifying to you, I'm sure. So thank you for this opportunity again to come together as men. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, um, Acts chapter 1, if you want to go there. Um, also, the only other book that we're going to be going to tonight, um, if you want to follow along, is going to be Luke chapter 1, and then we'll flip to Luke chapter 24 at, at some point. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of uh, orientation of the book of Acts, right? I mean, that's what uh, Pastor David would do if he was um, uh, starting off with a new book, uh, as he often does, he's been through uh, nearly, probably more than half of the Bible now, Old Testament and New Testament included. So we get to Acts, and one of the subtitles uh, that is mo in most people's Bibles, it says it's the Acts of the Apostles. I've heard in some commentaries, or I've read, looked at in some commentaries and in other Bibles and online and so forth, uh, alternate subtitles might be titled, you know, God Creates His Church. That could be a subtitle to the book of Acts. Or another subtitle could be Christ in the church. Could be another subtitle. Or another one yet could be Behold, He Lives. Could be another subtitle. Um, but the one that is in most people's Bibles probably is the Acts of the Apostles. And we'll talk more about that as far as subtitles go uh, in just a few minutes. So I'm going to jump in with just kind of giving an overview of the book of Acts as I jump in. I'm not going to cover the whole book's book of Acts 1 I'm sorry, chapter 1 tonight. I'm going to get through verses 8. Um, and then next week, I'll finish chapter 1. Uh, I believe a chapter, uh, or from verse 8 all the way through verse 26 uh, next week. Uh, and as and maybe I didn't mention, but the whole book of Acts, we're going to go through and complete by December 20th this year. So there's going to be an opportunity each time you come in here, each and every Tuesday night, to hear from one of the elders of the fellowship here. So it's going to be a great opportunity for you to not just um, meet and hear uh, Pastor Lee and Pastor Kevin teach, because there, there are other teaching pastors alongside Pastor David, but you're going to see and meet um, six or seven of the other elders as well that are going to be involved in teaching. So again, jump into the overview for the book of Acts. Uh, the infectious news about Jesus Christ spread from person to person and city to city. It did face opposition, but the news being empowered by the Holy Spirit allowed the followers of Christ to relay the good news from eyewitness accounts about Jesus everywhere. From Jerusalem to Rome in 30 short years is what happened throughout the book of Acts. The recurring theme of this book is that our spiritual ancestors were empowered 
by the Holy Spirit, and that same power is still available to us today. We're going to talk about this power and what that means uh, later in tonight's study. And God has not left us at the mercy of our own weaknesses, and we know we all have weaknesses of one shape, form, or, or another. He has sent the Holy Spirit to help us follow their example, our spiritual ancestors' example, and to be witnesses in all the earth. So that's kind of the, the theme of the book of Acts. We're going to be witnesses, or we should be witnesses, to all the earth. That was one of Jesus' commandments that we hear about in the uh, end of the book of Matthew uh, and in the end of the book of Luke. So the author of the book of Acts, the who. You know, we always talk about what, what is the who, what, when, where, and why of something to help you kind of get a, your mind wrapped around certain things. So the who, the author of the book of Acts, we, it's commonly accepted that it is Luke. Luke is a, a Gentile doctor. So if you weren't familiar with the term Gentile, what does Gentile mean? Well, it's basically just any non-Jewish person is called a Gentile. So he's a, a doctor. He wrote the book of Acts to show the fulfillment of Jesus' words. We'll talk about that as well coming up. This book opens or begins in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost with the disciples huddled in a room, the upper room we'll read about uh, uh, later in chapter 1. The Holy Spirit then came upon them and authorized them to be witnesses. We're going to talk about what it means to be a witness also tonight. The rest of Acts describes the ripple effect of that great event of Jesus Christ un unleashing his spirit on the apostles in this upper room. Um, so the, the book of Acts is going to cover uh, a great multitude of miracles and events that we're going to have the, the, the beauty of reading and studying here soon. The book of Acts begins with a reference to the author's former accountant written to Theophilus, which is a clear reference to the Gospel of Luke. Even though the author of the book of Luke and Acts does not name himself, he doesn't come out right and say in any of those two books that, hey, this is Luke writing, um, it is accepted that the non-Jewish Luke is the author of both books, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. So the when, the date. Dating of the writing of this book is kind of not conclusive. I mean, being an engineer myself, I really like things when they're black and white. And I really wish I could go to some commentary or any one of your Bibles and say, hey, this is right where it says the book of Acts was written. Um, but I'm going to kind of show you that it's kind of inconclusive. There is no definitive month and day and year that the book of Acts was written by Paul. I'm sorry, by um, Luke. <laughs> uh, Paul's house arrest in Rome was around A.D. 60. So this is going to be our possible earliest point uh, of Paul's arrest in Rome was around A.D. 60, marking the earliest this book could have been written. The book of Acts does not mention either the fall of Jerusalem, which was in A.D. 70. So that happened in A.D. 70 by the Romans or the persecution of the Christians following the fire of Rome in A.D. 64. So those late events in 64 and 70 are not mentioned in uh, the book of Acts either. Roman Emperor Nero blamed the fire on the Christians and began killing many of them. Surely Paul would have written about the fall of Jerusalem or the fire of Rome if they had occurred before he uh, finished writing the book of Acts. So the latest date of completion would be AD 64, leaving us with the range between AD 60 and AD 64 for writing of the book of Acts. All right, so we kind of know a little bit about the who. We know a little bit about the when. Uh, the what. Uh, we call this kind of the purpose. The, the book of Acts provides a condensed history of the early church, an eyewitness account of the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. The recurring theme is that our spiritual ancestors were empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that, and that same power is still available to us today. God has not left us again at the mercy of our weaknesses. He has spent, sent the Holy Spirit to be with us and to give us the power to be uh, witnesses throughout the whole earth. Theology. Uh, the book of Acts reassures believers that their faith in Christ rests on facts in history. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are well-documented facts throughout history. The early Christians were not testifying about a dead Christ, but a living Christ whom they had seen with their own eyes. They had eyewitness accounts of Jesus 
after his resurrection for 40 days before his ascension. So Jesus lives and continues to work through the church today. Amen. The work, or now the where, is Jerusalem as we get, begin Acts chapter 1. So does the Acts, the book of Acts, does it pick up right where the Gospels kind of stop? Well, sort of, if you mean the Gospel of Luke, meaning the last thing Luke records, uh, and that's one of the uh, synoptic Gospels, is Jesus telling the apostles to wait in Jerusalem until they are endued with power, and that is what we'll also read about here in the first chapter of Acts. So the last thing he says in the book of Luke is for them to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Uh, and he says they don't have, they're not going to have to wait a long amount of time for this to happen. And it turns out um, they don't. Um, there's going to be a couple words that I, I have written in my notes here that are uh, read. And uh, I'll kind of do like this maybe when I do that word because you don't have your no my notes in front of you. But the one word here is called endued because I'm going to go through several words and several different scriptures coming up that, that similar words are used to describe the Holy Spirit coming upon us, filling us, enduing us, being poured out upon us. So there's several different words I'm going to show you in Scripture that have that same meaning. So uh, all the words are trying to describe the same thing. So I didn't want people to be confused when I read a certain passage that uh, a when I say a certain word, it's all saying the same thing, that the Holy Spirit is going to uh, fill us or empower us or be endued upon us. So, um, and the, when I get to those passages in scriptures, I'll, I'll make those clear to you as well. The book of Luke was only the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, so the book of Acts is really kind of an unfinished book in the sense that Jesus' work is still being performed in the world today. So the book of Luke is kind of the beginning. The book of Acts is not the end. It's just a continuation after the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Because again, as I mentioned a couple of times now, Jesus' ministry is ongoing. It's still living uh, in the world today. Some people have called it, you know, what we're living in right now is actually Acts chapter 29. Uh, the, the living continuation of Jesus' ministry. Unfortunately, the subtitle found in many Bibles, as I alluded to earlier, says that the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. But as we read through the whole book between now and the end of December, uh, we'll see that the book focuses mainly on Peter uh, for kind of almost the first half, half of the book, and then Paul uh, for the rest of the book of Acts. So again, a little bit more about Luke. Who is Luke? A little bit more information. He was the only Gentile author of all the authors of the books of the Bible. There was another um, uh, non-Jewish contributor to the Bible, and you may remember in the book of Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, there was a portion in there where he wrote a couple, I don't know if it was a chapter or not, uh, well, it's beside the point. There was Nebuchadnezzar wrote some amount of, I just can't remember how much, in the book of Daniel, so if it was a whole chapter or just a couple passages. Um, I didn't go look there uh, before tonight. But I remember Luke is the only author of a whole book, and actually two books of the Bible, uh, being non-Jewish. All the other authors of all the other books of the Bible were Jewish authors. And as uh, Pastor David alluded to, uh, Jesus was Jewish, most certainly. Uh, Luke also was a doctor. Uh, a careful study of the book of Luke and the book of Acts, uh, you will see that only kind of someone that has a doctor's or a physician's background would show the amount of detail uh, and knowledge that Luke has, uh, being a doctor, and that's kind of why his writing kind of stands out and is somewhat unique compared to the uh, I hate to say unlearned, but the unprofessionally teached other gospel writers like Matthew, Mark, and John. So Luke was a doctor. Uh, I'd like to retell a short story that I heard recently um, Skip Heitzig um, share. Uh, he was at a conference one day overseas, and some proud man came up to him 
one day, and this was several years ago, and uh, th this proud man with his friend standing next to him was talking to Skip and saying, hey, you wouldn't believe how the church over here has just been growing and growing, and you know, we've had to go from one service to two services to three services, and, and man, we're just, I think it was around 2,500 people we had at our last service. This is just awesome, and we've just never seen numbers like this before. And he went on and on and on like this for a couple minutes, and then his friend kind of stopped him kind of abruptly and said, brother, when are you going to start living in the book of Acts instead of the book of Numbers? <laughs> and he was just all focused on the book of Numbers, I mean, the numbers of his church. And his, and his brother kind of had the whole right frame of mind, you know, let's, let's start living in the now um, and start living and recognizing how Jesus is working in your church. That's why he's bringing the people to your church. Uh, so I thought that was a kind of a cool little anecdote or story. Uh, Skip also mentioned that this book of Acts spans between the years of A.D. 33-ish to A.D. 63-ish. Again, I'm not going to argue or haggle about the numbers, but it's roughly in those ranges of 33 A.D. to 63 A.D., so say 30 years that the book of Acts encompasses. So although you could read through the whole book of Acts in 30 minutes, it encompasses 30 years worth of time. And interestingly enough, I was looking up the amount of miracles that are recorded in the book of Acts, and there's no less than 16 miracles recorded in the book of Acts. Uh, in some areas I found, they, depending on how loose you want to call a miracle, um, I, I saw as much as 24. So no less than 16 different miracles in the book of Acts, which I thought was pretty amazing, because sometimes you hear about um, people saying, well, it's just like a miracle every five minutes back in the early church days. But it wasn't really that many miracles. There was a lot of them, but over 30 years, you know, there's no less than 16, maybe up to 25 or so. But so there's a lot of action happening for sure in the book of Acts. So I think now we are ready to jump into verse 1 of the book of Acts. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up. We're going to read through verses 1 through 8, and then I'm going to backtrack and uh, expound uh, briefly on uh, several of the verses and bring out a few key highlights. So Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking on the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So that was um, verses 1 through 8. So now if you want to flip back to Luke, um, probably 60, 80 pages back in your Bible to the left, to Luke chapter 1, verse 1. And this is just kind of going back because we mentioned earlier that the former account that it talks about here in verse 1 is actually referring back to part 1 of what we could call Luke's volume. So part 1 is essentially Luke, the book of Luke. And so I'm just going to read through four verses here. Luke 1, verses 1 through 4. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So Luke is claiming to have 
uh, this perfect understanding of the things from the very first. And he's recording all of this for this person called Theophilus, which we're going to talk about uh, who he might have been uh, early in my teaching here. So now flip to the very end of the book of Luke, Luke 24. Luke 24, verses 44 to 49. <clears throat> verses 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Can you imagine what that might have been like? He opened their understanding. Wow. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So you can see kind of the same message that we just read in verses 1 through 8 in the book of Acts, chapter 1, uh, are also in the end of Luke, chapter verse 24. All right, so now I'm going to go, now you can flip back to Acts, chapter 1, and now we're going to go through those uh, eight verses, 1 through 8. And just mention that some commentators have suggested that this Theophilus that we just read in verse 1 of Acts and in verse 1 of Luke chapter 1, Theophilus actually means friends of God or a lover of God. Uh, some comment commentators suggest that this could just be a, a symbolic name meant to represent a class of people or maybe even the church. Um, in this view, Luke would be addressing his work basically to the honored Christian reader, if that was the case, that honored Christian reader would be us. You know, all the partakers of the uh, documented word that's lasted for 2,000 years now, that may have been who Luke was referring to. Uh, again, you and me. More likely, though, however, uh, Theophilus was a real person uh, with a name that all others also had in the ancient times. Apparently, it was a common name back then, Theophilus. Um, so it was a, a Greek name, but it was apparently not uncommon to hear that name. So very most likely, it was a real person that Luke wrote uh, to in the first chapter of Luke and in the first chapter of Acts. In addition, Theophilus may have been Luke's former master. And you say, Luke was a slave? Well, back in those days... In the, of the early church, doctors, I understand, were actually owned. A lot of times they were owned by a wealthy person or a wealthy family that a wealthy person or family would actually purchase a doctor. That doctor would actually live and stay with that family and take care of that family. And again, back in those days, you know, many families were four, five, six kids in a family, uh, an agrarian society, so usually a lot bigger families than we have now. Um, maybe I'll call out Cecil, maybe except for Cecil's family. <laughs> um, I think he's up to, what, seven kids now, Cecil? He's not here tonight to corroborate, but I'm sure he'll be listening to this at, at some point. Um, so, yeah, this could have been his master. Um, uh, the physician was to serve with this person and or family only as a, a purchased doctor. But probably at this point, now he's been probably released from being the master of Theophilus so that he could travel and be with Paul. Um, again, I couldn't find any conclusive evidence that that was the case, but most likely that's who Theophilus was. It could have been Paul's former or current master. So how about this word began that we see in verse 1, where it says Jesus began both to do and to teach. Well, the book of Luke chronicles the beginning works and miracles of Jesus in his ministry. Uh, the book of Luke could be considered part one and Acts actually part two of the volume of Luke. 
Um, so Acts is actually a sequel to Luke, if you want to kind of look at it that way. Again, right after the end of Luke chapter 24, we pick up with Acts chapter 1. So again, that's why I'm calling them like part one, part two of one volume. Um, the book of Luke could be aptly named. This is kind of where I was going to mention about a, a, a different subtitle. Um, the book of Luke could be aptly named the Acts of Jesus Christ before his ascension. Because everything that we read about in the book of Luke um, takes us right up to his ascension. All the acts, all the things that Jesus did in ministry up until that point. And then the book of Acts could be aptly named the Acts of Jesus Christ after his ascension. Because right in the very beginning, in Acts chapter 1, we read about Jesus' ascension. You know, after the 40 days spent with the apostles, he ascends. That we'll uh, pick up next week in verse 9. We see Jesus ascending to heaven in verse 9, which we won't cover tonight. So the rest of the whole book of Acts is what happens in ministry um, after his ascension. So those are two other possible um, subtitles, but again, I'm sure we'll stick with the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, that's what's in most of our Bibles. Um, in verse 3, I just wanted to bring attention to what it's calling their uh, infallible proofs. Is there such a thing as an infallible proof? Infallible means incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. Um, I was listening to Pastor Chuck Smith uh, a while back, and just for a point of reference, Pastor Chuck was born in 1927, and he died just recently in 2013. So back in 1927, add on, say, 18 years when he graduates from high school, uh, would it be 1945. Um, and he was mentioning in one of his teachings that when he was still in school, so in the late 1940s, if he graduated high school and then went to college, it would have been 45 and later, so I said the late 40s, they taught a fact back then that the earth was 4 billion years old. As an infallible truth, it was a fact in 1945-ish that the earth was 4 billion years old. And then in this teaching, which was um, from, uh, I believe, 2012, Pastor Chuck said that, um, that the, he heard recently, <laughs> bless you, <laughs> in a uh, school there in California, uh, that they were teaching now this infallible fact that the earth is now 12 billion years old. So in a span of 70 years, say 1945 to 2015, 70-ish years, this infallible fact has now changed by 8 billion years. Whoa, that doesn't seem possible for an infallible fact. So is there such a thing still? Well, I believe that there is. An infallible truth uh, is convincing and there is de decisive proof that something is actually true and real. Uh, the birth, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ are rooted, solidly rooted, in history. You've heard Pastor David and Pastor Kevin and probably even Pastor Lee share from the stage that there is more documented proof of the life, death, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ than George Washington ever crossed the Delaware or that Caesar actually lived and breathed. So there's more proof that, of Jesus' life in secular history and obviously in the Bible too that this is a fact, um, and just hopefully I can get the facts correct. Um, Simon Greenleaf, I believe that was his first name, he was the actual, actually the founder of Harvard College. He was an, either an agnostic or didn't believe in Christ, but he was a lawyer, and he studied the scriptures just to find out more about it, and he actually got converted, and then he started the, the, law, or the law school, Harvard, um, way back whenever that was, but it was uh, several, several years ago, and it originally was a very Christian-based law school. Um, and it was all because of the evidence that this renowned lawyer uh, dug up about the Bible, and he, he found significant enough evidence in Scripture and in secular history that there was, he could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ lived, was killed, died, buried, and came back to life. That's how cons um, proof positive, he considered that an infallible truth or proof 
that Jesus did live, breathe, die, and was resurrected. So that to me is a, an infallible uh, truth. And these are the, some of the things you know, that Jesus is saying here, or Luke is saying here, about it, by many infallible proofs. These were probably some of the miracles that took place um, and that were witnessed by many, many people. So verse 3, also, I wanted to touch on the words that are brought up here. The kingdom of God was one of Jesus' favorite topics to talk about. He spoke of it often in Scripture. During the 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the kingdom of God was a central topic of discussion, Scripture here says. We have, fault, we have faulted the disciples often uh, for their timing of the kingdom of God uh, because they had no clue when it might come and they couldn't fathom the idea that it wasn't going to come in their present time. They expected Jesus at any given time um, to overthrow Rome and uh, put in his kingdom in their present day and age. And it just never uh, came to pass for them. And so they just couldn't understand when this kingdom of God that he spoke about so often was going to come to pass. Uh, this topic, though, is or was a position of hope uh, that Jesus was planting in their hearts and to be planted in all hearts of men, wanting them to understand that things will not always be corrupted and that the world will not forever be under the bondage of evil. That's what he was trying to illustrate with what the kingdom of God was going to be and what it could be. We should desire the kingdom of God and hope in it as well. So we still need to be looking forward to this kingdom of God. <clears throat> Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father is no doubt what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. You don't have to go there, but I'm going to read a couple of uh, scripture passages in chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out, there's a, I, my quotation marks, pour out uh, my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also my maid, men's, I'm sorry, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will again pour out my spirit in those days. The promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we read about here. Here it's referencing, you know, the, the uh, phrases pouring out uh, of the spirit on all flesh. We'll talk more about this uh, pouring out and the baptism of the spirit towards the end of the teaching here. Moving on to verse 5. John only baptized with water, which means to cleanse by dipping or submerging or to immerse, uh, to wash, to make clean with water. And it really connotes or to, it means being identified with someone or something. Uh, and that's what baptism does mean. This is awesome and great, but something even better is coming for them not many days from now, as it mentions here in scripture at the very end of verse 5 when it says you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now <clears throat> Jesus tells them to wait in verse 4 which I just read it says just wait wait at this point you know they got to be pumped up and juiced up and just ready to go and, and do stuff and he's saying wait how well do we wait? How well do you wait? Well, I, I, I don't wait so well sometimes. I, I think I've got more patient over the last few years or maybe decade or so of my life. Um, like, for instance, if I have to wait to get my tooth drilled to fill a cavity, I'm fine with waiting, right? We can wait for that all day long and all month long, right? Um, but if I have to wait at a stoplight for more than 15 nanoseconds, uh, that doesn't go so well. I like to, you know, I got places to go and things to do, right? <laughs> we all do. I mean, sometimes it's just uh, tough to be impatient. I mean, it's tough to be patient um, when we have to wait for certain things to happen or to be fulfilled. But Jesus tells them to wait. Just hang around and wait to be filled, to receive this power when the Spirit has come upon you. 
Uh, we'll be talking about that. So they're waiting for this power. This is the power that we read also in verse 8. And it's the power we're going to find out to be witnesses. This is the power that they're waiting for, to be witnesses. We so far have read the term Holy Spirit a couple times now as well. In the New King James Version, in the book of Acts, you'll see the Holy Spirit mentioned 41 times, four times in this chapter 1. And for those of you that uh, follow the, the King James Version, it also mentions the Holy Ghost, not the Holy Spirit, 41 times, and also four times the Holy Ghost is mentioned in chapter 1. So it's very similar between the two versions, just Holy Spirit in the New King James and Holy Ghost in the King James. So I thought that was interesting because I just, you know, I happened to see Holy Spirit a couple times in just these eight verses. So I, I, I looked it up on the, you know, the online Bible software, and you could probably use a concordance to do the same thing. And um, I think it was mentioned uh, 91 times in the whole book. Um, I'm sorry, in the whole Bible. I think that's what it was, 91 times. Um, yeah, in the whole Bible, about 92 times, but 41 times here in the book of Acts. Um, so that's uh, quite a preponderance of the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost being mentioned here in the book of Acts. So we mentioned on verse 4 and verse 5, so moving on to verse 6 now, let me reread verse 5 and 6 because it's kind of, this is a weird question that's posed in verse 6 uh, for the apostles to ask Jesus. So let's reread verse 5 and 6. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? That seems like a weird question, doesn't it? He just talks about John baptizing, baptizing in water, and then they ask him, are you going to restore the kingdom? I mean, how are those related? I mean, I'm sure he must be thinking in his head. Where, where, you guys are not focusing here. Stay with me. Why are you asking this type of question? Um, when, it was, when I'm just talking about something totally different than what you're asking me now. So per, Jesus pretty much brushes aside their question because he doesn't come right out and answer their question, does he? Uh, at least we didn't, we didn't read about it in verse 7 and verse 8. He pretty much says to them, it's not for you to know right now. How hard is that for us to hear sometimes when somebody tells us, well, they probably don't tell us to our face that often, that it's not for you to know. Maybe that's something our parents told us uh, when we were younger, but we don't hear that too much now as a, an adult, though, do we? He knows they have been waiting for Jesus. I was, I was trying to paraphrase this uh, somewhat differently. Jesus was saying that he knows that the disciples are pro have probably been waiting for him to just all, all of a sudden one day rush off into a phone booth, change his clothes and come out with, with a cape on and be like Superman and just be ready to, re again, restore the kingdom of God, uh, which is what they keep asking for, return, restore the kingdom to Israel. And that's not happening. So they're very confused and they're, they're kind of rushing to the point. Um, Jesus is talking about one thing and they're saying, well, yeah, 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 I'm hearing what you're saying, but when are you going to restore the kingdom? Uh, and they want this to happen so badly. Um, and then when they... They just got done watching Jesus die on the cross, and they were so sad and confused then, and, and still now, they're still confused and not knowing exactly what's going on. And later, we're going to read about the two fellows on the road to Emmaus, how confused they were um, as well. But Jesus uh, opened their, their minds and understanding to the scriptures as well, we'll read about later. So you know what? We are not told to understand all things, but to give thanks for all things. So that's kind of what Jesus was kind of saying without those words when he was just kind of brushing off their question and not even answering it. So finally into verse 8, where we're going to uh, camp on for the rest of the, the, the teaching here. Let's read it one more time. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So what do witnesses do? Witnesses proclaim their belief and will die for their beliefs. We would call that a martyr, someone that dies for their beliefs. A martyr will not recant or turn away from what they believe. That's kind of the definition of a, 
a, a martyr. Being a martyr only proves what they were. They were a witness. Proving their genuineness of faith in Jesus by, by undergoing a violent death. Uh, all 11 of the 12 disciples uh, or apostles uh, died a violent death, save John, who was exiled at, at some point to the uh, island of Patmos. So he didn't die a violent death like many of the other or the other 11 apostles did. No one willingly dies either for something that they do not believe in. So you can imagine at some point in time that all 12 of these disciples saw something and were taught something by Jesus. We know that they lived and walked with him for 40 days be between his resurrection and the ascension. So they got to learn and see and know th so many things about Jesus in those 40 days that just so convinced them that he is alive. He was dead, but he didn't stay dead. Wow. How, how can we wrap our minds around that? And that's why they were willing to be persecuted and tortured and beaten, some skinned alive, some sawn in half, many violent deaths, and they did not recant. Because what they knew what they were testifying of and sharing with other people was true. They knew and believed without a doubt that Jesus was still alive. So that's why they, they died that violent death as a witness or as a martyr, we would call it. <clears throat> So here what we're reading also in verse 8, these are Jesus' last words to his apostles. Anyone's last words are important. I mean, Carson sang that song about this lady, um, uh, and he may have been around for some of her last words. If her family happened to be uh, in the room and she got to share and spend time with her family uh, before she passed on, her last words, I'm sure, were totally love-filled and truthful and honest about everything. She had nothing to lose at that point. Um, we may have had parents that we spent time with just before their passing, or grandparents maybe just before their passing. So how important were those last words to you when you were actually able to spend time with that loved one and hear whatever they may have shared with you on that given day? So just imagine how important the last words of Jesus must have been to these men. <clears throat> the power that we read about here of the Spirit came upon them. This power is what you've heard called in the Greek uh, dunamis, um, or where in English we get our words for dynamite, and also the word, I believe, uh, dynamic, I've heard mentioned. So dunamis is this word that's mentioned there in by. Um, by the word power. Uh, in Greek, it's called dunamis. <clears throat> it's an inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. So this, this Holy Spirit, it has a he, the Holy Spirit is not an it, but he can come and present himself and it, we can experience, I should say, the Holy Spirit kind of in three different ways. Or in three different, if we're a believer, we've kind of had an experience or a locality of the Holy Spirit in three different forms or fashions here. There's three Greek words <clears throat> that kind of illustrate the locality or experience of the Holy Spirit. Para, P-A-R-A. -A. <clears throat> this means in, to come alongside us, where the Holy Spirit would come alongside us or be with us us. Um, this is kind of before our conversion or before salvation. This is, so this is the Greek word of the Holy Spirit coming alongside of us or being with us. We read about this often in the Old Testament. Saints like Samson and David in the Old Testament had only the Spirit come alongside them or this Holy Spirit was with them uh, in the Old Testament. And then the second Greek word is en, E-N. And that's basically when the Holy Spirit comes in you. And that happens at conversion, or some might call it regeneration, uh, or at our salvation experience. So that's the Holy Spirit in, or in you. 
And then the third word is epi. And that's what this word here in this verse 8, when it says upon, the Greek word upon is epi, E-P-I. And that word means filled to overflowing. Uh, and this happens after conversion. And this can actually happen more than once. Uh, we'll, I'll show examples of scripture here coming up where uh, some people are filled or the Holy Spirit comes upon them more than once. Uh, it was probably three or four months ago, maybe more, when Pastor David had a, a goblet that he put up on the, the, the table, his little podium there when he was teaching on a Sunday morning. And it, was, it had a big cup or like a goblet on the top and then a circular tray around it and then the little spigots coming out of the side of this big cup. And what he did was he was pouring, well, in, back in, you could pour wine into it or you could pour water into it. Whatever you were pouring into it, it would fill that upper goblet or cup up and then it would overflow into these other cups or this basin underneath. So kind of think of, you know, the Holy Spirit coming into us and filling us to overflowing where we just have to, we just can't hold it in anymore and we have to go share the gospel or go teach somebody something or do a, a loving act of kindness to somebody. It, it's because the Holy Spirit is just in us and filled us up where we just got to let some of it out. And you've heard Pastor David say sometimes where, um, you know, sometimes we have to continually pour out so that there's room for the Holy Spirit to fill us up. Um, so that's something where some people get stagnant in their faith and kind of sit back on their laurels or just kind of sit back and aren't as active as maybe as they once were. So they're, they're just not pouring out anymore. But I mean, that's kind of a bad example. They, they need to be filled so that they can pour out more than what they have been. So this power was given and it is the power to be witnesses. That's why Jesus wanted them to wait in Jerusalem. So they could, they had kind of the knowledge and the understanding but they needed still something extra. They needed a little bit more oomph. Uh, they needed this power to be witnesses so that they could take their undeniable faith and understanding in Jesus and take it to the ends of the earth, like it says here at the end of verse 8. Can you imagine what their mission was, should they choose to accept it, is to go throughout the world. The known world to them was really small compared to what we know the world to be now. But we are kind of the, the outer edges of the world to them, you know, being as far west as we are now from where Jerusalem is, we're almost halfway around the world. Um, so they had no idea of how far their word was going to be traveling and how long it was going to be shared over and over and over because God was able to preserve his word. But they were now given this power to be witnesses, and that's what Jesus knew they needed, and that's why he told them to wait. To wait. So an, a, a witness example here, I have two. We need to pray for our president. Uh, that's what the scriptures call us to do. Not just the president that we have now, but any president we've ever had or ever will have, we need to pray for that president. The scripture calls us to respect the authority. Washington right now has the power to make abortion legal, right? They, over any given amount of time, they can create laws and put them into place, which we've seen happen. So imagine that they make abortion legal everywhere. But if the church were to do its job well and preach the word so that it so impacted the nation and women all over the world believed, accepted the gospel and believed the gospel so, so that maybe there wouldn't be eventually any women that even that would want an abortion because of what the word has been teaching them that it wouldn't even matter what the law says because the law wouldn't matter they don't want an abortion anyway if the church was doing what it could and should be doing to let them know what the word says so that's again that would, that could be our witness example sharing i mean if that's a burden for you to to share the word which it should be for all of us but this, one, this here's one example. Another example is George Whitfield. Um, some of you may have heard George Whitfield. He was a renowned English open air preacher and evangelist that lived in the early 1700s, so long, long time ago. When George Whitfield preached in Philadelphia in 1739, the bars, the pubs, 
closed down. So why would that happen? Well, not because he preached about not drinking alcohol anymore. He didn't preach that. But what he did do was he preached the word and Christ so powerfully that there weren't anyone wanting, there weren't any more patrons wanting to go to the bars and the pubs anymore. And because of the so few patronage people coming to the bars, the, the owners just had to close down. And who recorded this or where did I find this information from? was actually Benjamin Franklin was a listener to George Whitfield back in this day in 1739 um, and shared this information. You can Google it and there's just a ton of information out there on George Whitfield. I guess he must have had like a booming voice because they didn't allow him to share a pulpit in town. So he had to go outside of town and go into the open fields and there he would just share with his natural voice, no amplifiers, no, what do they call that, a megaphone. megaphone to amplify his voice or anything like that. So he just had a, a, a deep voice uh, um, that was amazing, and he could just share the word in Christ so powerfully that he converted hundreds of people back then um, and around the world. So it was just amazing. What he, so that's a witness example, again, of what one person can do. Uh, and we, I'm sure you can find hundreds, thousands of uh, examples over history um, of what we can do with the power of the Holy Spirit in us to impact those around us. So let me come back to this word upon in verse 8 once again. This word upon expresses an idea of a believer being filled with the Spirit. So now here's where I'm going to go through a couple passages in Scripture. You can flip to them if you like, or I'll just read them to you. Luke 24, 49, which we've already read, says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued, there's another one of those words, with power from on high. So when you hear me say upon or endued or baptized or filled or fallen upon, these are all different ways to describe the same thing. Acts 1, verse 5, which we've also read. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Acts 2, verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Acts 8, verse 16. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 10, verse 45. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Ephesians 5, verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So again, all these words poured out, fallen upon, baptized, endued. These are all words saying the same thing, but in a different way. So when you hear those words, understand what it's trying to express. We have to be willing, and He will do the filling. He, we have to be willing, and He will do the filling. Acts 4, verse 8 is another example. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, hmm, Acts 4, verse 8, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. But wait, wasn't Peter already a believer, saved and filled with the Holy Spirit already? I would say yes. We're going to read about at Pentecost, chapter 2 of Acts, coming up in a few weeks that Peter, Peter was already a believer, already filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he was filled at Pentecost in chapter 2, but he got a fresh new filling here for a new undertaking. We see Peter ready to stand before the rulers of the Sanhedrin and is filled afresh right on the spot at that given point in time, right when he was getting ready to preach to these folks the Sanhedrin. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means has he been made well? And so on and so on. 
But right then, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Right when he needed that power, he was given it. He was filled afresh, filled anew. Further on, Acts 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Free refills. You love free refills, don't you? I know I love free refills. <laughs> Acts 13, verse 9. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. All right. Remember, Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit once already when Ananias laid hands on him, and then Paul received his sight and was filled with the Spirit. So that has happened already by the time, but now later in Acts 13, verse 9, he's filled again. So another fresh infilling for, for Paul. Yeah, baby, top me off is probably what he was saying, right? He, he, um, some of us have probably felt, hopefully, recently, that infilling of the Holy Spirit where we've prayed for it and God delivered. And you just kind of feel rejuvenated maybe uh, after a point of depression or just being weak or worn out physically or emotionally or spiritually, and you just break down and said, I've had enough, and you, maybe you fall on your face or you go to your knees and you're praying. And then many times, and hopefully when you do that, you are filled afresh. And that can happen and should happen often in their life. The last thing Jesus says to them here in verse 8 is, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But that word when is kind of the same thing as when or after. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit or when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And really this word witnesses where it says be witnesses He's right then and there, he's given them the power to be witnesses, not to go witnessing, but you are a witness. You can be a witness right now. It's, it's different to me than just go witnessing. Uh, you, you, as soon as we open our mouth, we know that we're successful at being a witness, right? That's what the word tells us in another passage, that as soon as we're obedient and faithful to share the gospel, that's being an effective witness. But they were given the power right then and there to be witnesses, uh, which to me is just a slight twist on just going witnessing. They had the power to do what they needed to do. And it's evident because we're still reading about the Bible 2,000 years later. So that's evidence that they knew what they were doing. They, gave, they were given the power to do what they did. And it is still for us today, that is, to have this power and to be witnesses we still have this available to us. Uh, Chuck Swindoll once said, we don't lack for knowing, we lack for doing. We don't lack for knowing, we lack for doing. So God has told us, Jesus has told us, we have a great commission to go forth into all the nations, all the nations, not just Kernersville, Winston-Salem, High Point, Salem, or what I say there? High Point, Winston-Salem, Greensboro. Uh, you get the idea, the triad. North Carolina, South Carolina, the world is where we should be going to be witnesses. We don't lack for knowing, we lack for doing. The apostles couldn't and wouldn't have done what they did if they believed that Jesus was dead, right? I, I mentioned that earlier, that you know, if they knew that this was a false, a scam, they probably would have recanted at some point under the threat of being beheaded or being tortured they would have recanted. They would say, oh, no, just hold it before you drop that guillotine on me. This was just a scam. This, we made this up. None of them did that. All 11 in death. They knew that Jesus was alive again. They walked and they talked with him 40 days after his resurrection, and they knew he was alive when he ascended. So let us not back down, give up or shut up, but become witnesses for Jesus. That's a, there's a lost and dying world out there, so let's go give them Jesus. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, for this message, and Lord, we just pray that you will continue to empower us and do us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Lord, help us to know and to understand your word in such a way that it's living within us. Lord, continue to give us courage, to give us boldness, 
to share, to go beyond our comfort zone sometimes, in essence, you know, to all the ends of the earth, even though we can't physically go them there ourselves quickly, but we have the power to witness to those around us immediately. Lord, give us that ability. Help us, Lord, to be bold and courageous enough to do that, to share your word, share the gospel. And Lord, again, I just thank you for this time together with these men. And Lord, we just thank you. Lord, just thank you for this blessed time together. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.